I'd like to refer to a few verses this morning from the 13th chapter of the book of Romans, from the first verse. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will they then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, now shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he heareth not, he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause, pay tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon everything. Render therefore to all their duties tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor, to whom honour. O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth fulfill and he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. May the Lord bless his word to us. And we're so glad today for that word. These verses draw our attention to the fact that God is in control. Let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. I have a problem with that. I admit. Because it's hard sometimes to accept that. To accept that those that are in control or would be in control wherever it is and the earth are the right person for that particular job. But we must remember that it was God who effectively handed over to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon authority in the earth. And of course Babylon was one of the greatest the most massive empires on the earth at that time. They had totally overcome Egypt, which was a great power prior to that, and they became, they had uh, overcome Assyria, that was an even greater power. And they had become the leading power on the face of the earth. And because Israel at that time were disqualified, because of their ungodliness and the fact they would not keep God's commandments and God's law, God handed the power over to this pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. And then we find that there were successes to Nebuchadnezzar. And we we're told this in the book of Daniel. Means of the Persians who overthrew Babylon. And they had an even greater empire. And then came Alexander the Great. And the great Grecian Empire was even greater. And then the Roman Empire. And all these powers were given their power, we are told, by Almighty God. How do we 
reconcile that with a God of love, with a God who is concerned for his people. We are told specifically that the powers that be are ordained of God. Whatever our personal views may be, it is a fact that we are witnessing, I believe, the collapse of human government, the breakdown of democracy. Right. It's becoming more and more difficult to determine what democracy is, which type of democracy, direct democracy, which comes through a referendum or a representative democracy which comes through the representatives in parliament or in leadership in other nations and of course many of us would question many of those who are in positions of power and authority but I believe it's vital to realize that human government is reaching the end of the road. And in that, I'm including dictatorships who are flexing their muscles to postpone their inevitable demise. Sadly, the inevitable conflict of the ages is fast approaching. We believe that on the authority of God's prophetic word. There's a little verse in Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, and it says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. It seems as though there's an unleashing of evil in the earth. I'm not optimistic about the economy. I know they're going to try and do the best they can. But if Babylon is falling, then I just pray that it's slow rather than fast. Because uh, I do believe that those people that do right in the sight of God are going to be blessed in spite of what's taking place. But there is coming a day when the prophecy will be fulfilled. How will you rich men? Because even those that are very wealthy at this moment in time are going to find that there is a day of reckoning. I'm not a negative person and I do not like preaching negative messages. I'm a person who always believes that faith can overcome everything. But for that to be possible, there would have to be a real turning back to God. But I believe that we shall see more and more evidence in the coming days that is going to cause us to recognize the absolute sovereignty of God. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 75, verse 7. But God is the judge. He put it down one and set it up another. Daniel, chapter 2, verse 21. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. Daniel chapter 4 verse 17, and this is very significant. It was a judgment that was to come on Nebuchadnezzar. And we are told this matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the Holy Ones. It's talking about the angelic beings. 
that carry out the will and purpose of God. And he goes on to say, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. Nebuchadnezzar had been told he was going to be this great emperor, and yet he was put through a process of judgment, which was a form of insanity for a period of time. And uh, he then went out among the animals. And uh, it was a terrible time and it looked as though the plan of God would never be fulfilled, but he made a full recovery in due time. He was being taught a lesson, but what a lesson. I'm sure we wouldn't like to be taught a lesson in that way. But it's very important to learn from these things. Daniel chapter 4 verse 26 said, They shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee. That was seven years on the, the uh, calendar, the Chaldean calendar at that time. Till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Those of us that study prophecy know that the seven times was a type and a symbol of the seven times in prophecy that we are told about by Daniel and also in the book of Revelation. In verse 34 of the same chapter, we read, And at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Verse 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? God taught the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar, who was really God and who was really in control. When evil men crucified Christ, it was due to the evil of men. They did cry out, crucify him. But we are told that it was God's plan all the time. <coughs> we read in Acts 2, Verses 22 to 24, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. In other words, God had a plan. And he had determined what was going to happen. And so God allowed and even used the evil of men at that time. Because it was in his plan that Christ should die. By the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And then in chapter 4 of Acts, from verse 25 we read, Who by the mouth of thy servant David hast said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? 
the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Prove a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast appointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. This was a prayer that was being prayed by Peter and the others that were gathered together at that time because at that time they had been threatened and they had even been thrown into jail themselves, Peter and John, and there were further threats if they were to continue to use the name of Jesus Christ. But they knew that that was the name in which was all authority in heaven and in earth, as Jesus himself had said. All power, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Yes. And I'm so glad for that power and that authority and for those early apostles and believers who recognized that. And so they could pray this prayer and say, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? When it seems as though there's raging and people are imagining that they're going to accomplish all types of things. No matter what they determine, they are powerless to change or to thwart God's plan and purpose. And many times what they decide to do, although it may be a wicked decision, works according to God's plan. Just like the Bible said in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God and are the call according to his purpose. I'm so glad that he's in control, aren't you? And we're required to respect those who are in authority and to obey them. And it would be less difficult for us today in this country than it was for those that were under the Roman Empire at that time to whom Paul was writing. I can imagine them having a lot of questions about why they should obey these people. But it's also said of us, there has to be authority and we are to respect that authority. However, where there is abuse of power, and where those that are in authority are trying to get us to disobey God, then we have to take a stand. So we have to recognize that where there is abuse of power, we must obey God. Acts 4.19 says, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken to you more than to God, judge ye. You judge whether it's right for us to obey you when you're telling us to disobey Jesus Christ. He told us to go to preach in his name. You're telling us we're not to speak in his name. And so they recognized that this was an instance where they must obey God rather than man. And in chapter 5, verse 29 of Acts, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Now if God is sovereign, what about man's will? How free is man's will. Well, let's look at the writing of the Apostle Paul. There's a scripture that says in Romans chapter 7, 18 and 19, Paul said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, 
I find not, for the good thing that I would do, I do not. But the evil thing that I would not do, I do it. You ever been in that situation? You get tempted. You don't want to be led by that temptation. We pray not to be led into temptation. But sadly, sometimes we find that our will is not strong enough. That is why we need the power of God's Holy Spirit. What Paul then goes on to describe in the next chapter as the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which made him free from that law of sin and death. He discovered that God's will could work in his life. There's another verse that says, No man can come to me except the Father who has sent me draw him. John 6, 44. Nobody can come to me. You know, we think that it's our decision. We decide one day to become a Christian. Somebody happened to go to church and uh, what the preacher said changed their life. But you see, in reality, that wasn't really my decision. I was meant to be there for a purpose. And I believe that God is in control. Ephesians 1 verse 11 says that God works all things after the counsel of His own will. He works everything according to the counsel of His will. And it says according to the purpose of him who works everything after the counsel of his will. In other words, God has a purpose that he's working out. And he will work everything in accordance with his will. That tells us, again, God is in control. Now, uh, I heard somebody explain it this way one time. and said, well, God is sovereign. What that means is it's like a, a tray and you've got insects on the tray. The insects can move around freely as long as they stay on the tray but there's a guard around that's keeping them there and uh, God is the one that's moving the tray around. But I don't think that that really is what the Bible means when it talks about the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign in everything. Even in our bad days and our good days. In, even in our bad decisions as well as our good decisions, somehow he causes it to work out for good. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be learning to make better decisions. Yes, we should. But God is very gracious in causing nothing to frustrate his plan for your life and for mine, no matter how wrong sometimes our decisions might be. God will bring us back on track. And as long as we are willing, then we will allow Him to do that. And He will change our lives and use us as part of His great purpose. God gave to man in the, in the beginning dominion over the works of His hands. But that didn't mean that He just had the freedom to do whatever he wanted with the earth. When he disobeyed God, he lost that dominion. I think that man has always retained a measure of dominion, thankfully, but it's not the dominion he was intended to have, or the world would be a much better place than it is. But I'm so thankful for the fact that God is in control of everything that happens in our lives. And He is in control of our past, our present, and our future. Paul says in Ephesians 1.11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. 
In other words, God knew us before we were born. He knew us before we came into this world. And He predestinated us. That's kind of an old-fashioned word, but it basically means that God has pre-planned our lives for His purpose. And if we will yield ourselves to His will, then we'll find that that works for good in our experience. Amen. Another verse in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10, tells us, by, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, and the good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. By grace you were saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's not our efforts. We can't come to him of our own free will. God has to draw us to him. But if we have a desire to know God, then that is God speaking to us. It is God drawing us. It is God who opens our understanding to the wonderful gospel. And I'm so thankful for his grace. I'm thankful today for the grace of God. We see that even in a lot of the things that are happening in the world, the things that would give us concern. Yet God is a God of grace. And God is working all things out according to His purpose. Frankly, I don't trust so-called democracy. But I do trust the sovereignty of God. Yes. And I believe that He is in control in spite of human weakness and failure. I believe that He is in control of the decisions that are made. And I'm so thankful that he will not only rule, but he will overrule where the wrong and the bad decisions are made. We are so thankful that he's in control. And uh, we can say that God is still on the throne. And he will remember his own. Though trials may press us and burdens distress us, he never will leave us alone. God is still on the throne. And he will remember his own. His promise is true. He will not, not forget, you. forget you. God yes. is still on the, on the throne. Let's just pray. Our Father God, we thank you for your presence today. We ask, O oh Lord, that we might have that reassurance in our hearts. That you are truly in control of all things. And no matter what the future holds, even the things that seem to be bleak, we thank you, Lord, that you are the one who can bless each individual who will put their trust in you. And that even in hard times, you will bring us through and you will bless us. And as we give to you, so you will give to us, pressed down and shaken together and running over. And so, Lord, we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your grace and your mercy. In the name of our Lord. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.